parental alienation and domestic violence. What gets lost in the fog? Since the term parental alienation appeared, countless articles have described the phenomenon of battered spouses losing custody of their children when their batterer defended with claims that the battered spouse tries to alienate them from their children. As a result, domestic violence advocates and some family court councils state that parental alienation is junk science and is a cancer in the family courts. Yet the reality is more complex. What is parental alienation? Parental alienation occurs when the children reject a relationship with a parent for unfounded reasons. The tragic feature of this rejection is that the relational distance isn't created by the parent-child relationship, but instead created by the vindictive, alienating parent or the dynamics of a high-conflict divorce process. In other words, children reject the alienated parent in an effort to remain attached and loyal to the alienating parent out of fear, love, or confusion. The child concludes that it's not safe for them to love both parents. In survival mode, they denigrate and reject one while idealizing and supporting the other. This is fundamentally different than parent-child estrangement. Estrangement occurs when a parent lacks parental fitness, leading to abusive and neglectful behaviors. As a result, children reject or withdraw from such a parent because of legitimate fears, anger, and disappointment. The other parent may engage in protective parenting that can be misconstrued as parental alienation, but it isn't. Loving parents want their children with safe caregivers. Where the road gets foggy? Parental alienation and domestic violence. Despite the criticism of parental alienation, it's a well-documented phenomenon in divorce cases. But sometimes, assessing the situation can be difficult, especially where the allegations of domestic violence are involved. In severe cases, the batterer may continue to use the children as a weapon to control their ex-spouse. They may only be interested in parenting in so far as it gains them access to their ex-lover with whom they remain obsessed. In milder cases, the domestic violence may have manifested from a conflict-based, unhealthy relationship. Once this relationship is dissolved, both parents may be capable of providing for the best interests of the children. On the opposite side, an angry, vindictive parent can use episodes of domestic violence as a weapon to totally deprive the other parent access to the children. They dupe the courts into thinking that the domestic violence is severe, intractable, and dangerous, when in fact it isn't. Is it child protection or parental alienation or both? When a person is abusive and violent to a parent in front of the children, the children become scared of that violent abuser. And when victims finally are able to leave their abusers, the children often relax into a new safe environment and resist parenting time with the abuser. A loving parent's support of this resistance isn't alienation tactics. It's called child protection. Batterers trying to avoid accountability can try to claim the victim role by painting child protection as alienation. There's a need for proper evaluation in custody cases because any of the following scenarios can occur. One, batterers obsessively pursue control over their partners and use the alienation of their children as an extension of that control over their ex-partner. Two, angry, vindictive parents who act out of their rage at their own abandonment by systematically alienating their children from a parent with no history of poor parenting. Or three, cases involving changing circumstances. For example, one parent has a history of problems such as substance abuse, poor parenting, or abusive behavior toward their partner, and then experiences a wake-up call and begins a legitimate path to recovery. Nonetheless, the other parent is understandably traumatized from the past and remains wounded, fearful, and mistrusting. This wounded parent begins acting on this trauma by engaging in parental alienation tactics. When this happens, the courts need to afford the traumatized parent treatment, not collude with their protracted trauma response, while also remaining vigilant in holding the recovering parent accountable. Understandably, 
Domestic violence advocates experience legitimate frustration when batterers dupe the courts into thinking they're a victim of parental alienation when they aren't. These are difficult cases, and in the maelstrom, advocates on both ends sometimes find themselves fighting for justice. Consequently, in their own professional trenches of warfare, they start working to disarm their foe. This is how the junk science allegations against parental alienation arise. Although protecting children's a noble cause, using such tactics isn't professional, isn't judicious, and isn't ultimately advocating for the best interests of all children, calling into question a well-documented phenomenon like parental alienation is fear-based and defensive. It grows out of a bias toward erring on the side of safety while setting the stage for potentially unwarranted denial of parenting time, which also harms the children. To explain this, let's use an illustration from other areas of law. For instance, mental health and criminal behavior. We know certain psychotic individuals can display poor judgment and aggressive behavior without any conscious intent to harm anyone, yet they do. In response, we try to understand how their mental illness is causing them to harm others, and we work to treat the origin of the problem rather than provide only putative time in jail for bad behavior. We get angry at criminals who falsely plead insanity in an attempt to absolve themselves from criminal behavior and punitive consequences, but we don't denounce mental illness as junk science in an effort to protect victims and hold criminals accountable. We know we must carefully evaluate each and every case to determine the truth. In the same way, if a loved one gets shot and killed by a criminal with an unregistered gun, we might wish to rid society of all guns in order to feel safer. Yet a more judicious and less emotionally reflexive response would be to work on gun law policies that get guns out of the hands of criminals and only into the hands of responsible citizens. Domestic violence advocates wrongly denounce parental alienation as junk science in an effort to take away a batterer's arsenal in custody litigation. Understandably, when engaged in protecting children, it's easy to get scared and angry and want to remove a weapon that can harm children. But denying that parental alienation exists is based in fear and ideology, and it will not forward the best interests of all children. We need to train professionals, including judges, on the intersection of domestic violence and parental alienation. Then we need to evaluate and process each family case by case. We need to continue to study, research, and evaluate parental alienation rather than throw it out. The more we learn about how vindictive parents can effectively alienate children from a good and loving parent, the more we can actually protect parents from parental alienation by a batterer. Let's walk together pursuing justice with courage rather than ideology with fear. Written by Randy Flood and produced by the Law Center. Click the link in the description portion of this video to learn more about them.